These are weapons of mass destruction. They really are. Um, um, and they can only, be, for me, they can only be described thus. Um, these are the deranged minds of humanity. This comes from a deranged mind. You can't create this unless you're mad. Reverend Eve, I'm interviewing you here as part of Black History Month, but should there be a Black History Month? No, there should be. History should be taught. White people's history, black people's history together. So we can have some serious analysis about how we've arrived here. As long as you just have Black History Month, nobody decides when I remember my history. My history is mine for me to remember 365 years, days a year. And when we reach the stage when it's just history, it's a long way, we have a long way yet. We're not yet secure enough. The society is not yet secure enough to say our history, let's look at history through both spectacles, all spectacles, and write history. Well, maybe that's simplistic, but that's my dream. You first arrived in Nottingham from Jamaica in the 1960s. What was, what was that like? Uh, it's a small place. Um, looking back, I felt small in a big place, but it's, it's quite a small place. Um, it was a small community, the Caribbean community. And I think consequently we stayed together, we hung around together as kids. When I look back now, we had to stay together. It was the only way we, could, we felt safe. There was safety in numbers. Uh, there was a sense in which um, where you wouldn't even dream of going out by yourself. Your parents wouldn't let you go out alone because it really wasn't unusual to meet racism in your face. And by that I mean it wasn't unusual for people to roll down their windows, spit, and if they didn't do that, they would call you the N-word. So this, this aggression, you knew where you stood and you prepared yourself accordingly. How were you taught to respond to that type of racism? When we were experiencing racism, um, and you go home and say, well, you know, this has happened to me, our parents would say, well, never mind, just, just look the other way and... Um, and, you know, don't, don't say anything. And, and it was their way of coping. And I only have one incident that I can remember when um, police came to our youth club. Right, so it's nothing new, this police coming into, uninvited into black space. Um, and I remember uh, at the time being in youth club and uh, the police came in with a dog. Yeah, a youth club with a dog that somebody told them that we had drugs in our youth club. And the person who was running the youth club said, no, no, these are, these are kids drinking cream soda. <laughs> you know, it's equivalent of lemonade. These are kids having a good time. There's no drugs in here. And at the insistence of um, the police, he said, you know, he would arrest those who had the drugs. There was nobody who had drugs and they hauled one child out, because we were kids, and, um, and took him to the station. I was incensed, and, and all of us were really angry about this, incensed, and we, and we just said, you know, um, you let him go. You let him go because this is a lie. This is a lie. And, and, and that was an overt sort of a reaction and response to what, as young people, we saw as terrible injustice. And I remember, you know, the response of my mother's generation was, well, never mind, you know, I saw them steer, you know, and uh, um, I hope you can keep that in, you know, because I love my mother's culture. I, I love the way they spoke. And, um, and, you know, it's going to be all right. And, and, and sort of pacifying us as young people. But we were incensed because we were determined that we weren't going to put up with what our mother's generation uh, put, you know, were having to put up with. Were you told as a child that there would be certain avenues that would be closed off to you because of the colour of your skin? I think, I think it probably makes more sense to say were there any 
avenues they told us that um, we could go down <laughs> um, because everything else, you know, um, the exclusion um, was, you know, most things weren't available to us. You know, unless you wanted to be a nurse, pretty laudable profession, but I would have made a terrible nurse um, or being a shorthand typist, which I had no desire to be. Um, or in, in certainly in Nottingham to go down to the lace market, which was what I was asked to do. It was very, very common for young children in my generation, not for no, no one to have any ambitions for them. Uh, I'm sure there were exceptions. But, um, my teacher did say to me, but you know, if Adney, you have a very beautiful voice, um, and because and, she heard me in the choir, and she said, you know, singing could be an option for you. But that, you know, in the last analysis, in the final analysis, I was sent to go um, to Lace Market to sew. And that was common. That was actually common, you know. Many of us were told that our dreams um, was just unrealistic. I think your generation have had it hard, but my generation, there was nothing sophisticated about racism. You know, um, I know my father's generation, and many of them who came with ambitions and training from the Caribbean. So it wasn't, certainly wasn't just my generation. My mother, extremely bright woman, very bright, articulate. Um, and many, there were many like her. She was by no means um, an exception to the rule. Um, and my father, and many more like my father, who wanted, my father wanted to be a barrister. So he had ambitions, but like so many of his generation and mine, the expectation was very low, and it still is. You know, this is nothing new. This has been well rehearsed and well practiced. When did you decide that you wanted the church to be your home? There was no one moment, really, um, because um, like so many Caribbean people and black people, we're deeply spiritual people, sometimes a bit too spiritual for our own good. And I say that without fear of any contradiction. Um, I, I grew up in the church and my grandfather was a minister, and, and I have yet to meet any black person who um, dare to say they haven't got a faith. Um, God has always been part of my life. We fight like dogs, really, pigs and dogs, for the whole nature of God and what God means to me. Um, as a black woman with a particular history, I, I, I've never found faith easy, but it's always been part of my life. Being a black woman vicar, surely that was one of the avenues that would have been closed off to you as a child. So why bother pursuing it? Because I'm who I am. Um, because I had a deep sense that God had had and did have his hands, her hands, upon my life. And, and I know that it was never going to be easy because nothing for us has ever been easy doesn't mean I don't do it. Becoming the first black Caribbean female vicar, that surely must have been a moment of immense pride for you. But was it also a reflection of progression in England? I think I came into the church at a good time when the church was beginning to wake up to the fact that there were some black people around with faith and they were able as well. And so, yes, let's, let's open the doors. Um, things were changing and there was a... The Church of England was beginning to wake up to the fact that a church with a sort of um, with people like me in there was, could only be good for the church. What were some of the challenges in getting to where you are now? I think some of the challenges for me was um, the fact that I was in a small group, a minority. I didn't see anybody who looked like me. Um, the whole theological framework was based around a particular group of people who look like someone else. So for me, it was fighting in my head intellectually to say, I want uh, a faith and I believe in a God who, um, who can understand my cultural um, norms and, and take that seriously. So I think... For me, it was the only way. There was no other way to do this but to come to be myself. Nothing else would work for me because I don't see how anyone can be taken really seriously if you have to cast off the clothes that you were born in in order to be accepted. 
Can you tell us about these chains and shackles that you keep here? I used to put this in, in the mouths of the person uh, you know, who's become a non-person, and they would slap it together, and, and they would, if you see those barbaric pictures, because that's barbarism, and, um, and they would walk for miles with this you know, terrible instrument of torture around their necks. This is not my shame, by the way, okay? There are going to be people thinking, oh, well, I think we ought to not put these on show um, because it's uh, an instrument of torture and shame. Well, actually, it's not my shame. I'm not ashamed of these at all. These are part of my ongoing story and the ongoing story of my people. So I'm not ashamed of them. We've been made as a people to feel ashamed of everything we have. So we're ashamed of skin shade. We're ashamed of our gorgeous, voluptuous backsides. You know, we're, you know, sort of black people have been made to feel ashamed about everything. I'm not. You've said before, though, that black history is not simply about slavery. I know that the history of Africa whether it's the riches of Africa, the African continent, which has been plundered, but also medicine, writing, music, can be traced back its origins to Africa. The books are there. They don't lie. They've been hidden, but they're there. It's not been in the interest of society at large. If you can tell, I've said this before and I'll say it again, if you can persuade a group of people that all they were, and all they were created for, was to be ch chattels of slavery, then it's no wonder they feel bad. It's no wonder they feel bad. That's the intention. If you can persuade people that they're nothing, then they will behave as if they are nothing. If you can tell them that's all they were born for, to be slaves, then they behave like slaves. Um, but we have to begin to educate. And I think we've started to educate ourselves, to take up a book and read it and, and make sure that we inform ourselves. And when you know yourself, you don't, have to other, you don't have to rely on other people's account of who they think you are. George Floyd! George Floyd! What was your reaction to the death of George Floyd in America earlier this year. When I first heard of this and saw this, interestingly, I didn't see the man on the floor. I didn't see this beautiful black man on the floor. All I see was this human being who purports to be a human being. He, wasn't, he became something else. I, I couldn't focus on... on, on what was you know, happening. I, I, could, I was just looking at this man who said he was human and superior. And what I saw was anything but. And for me, that was one of the tragedies. There were two tragedies, you know, a dead young black man and a white man purports to be superior, behaving in a most inferior way. And I felt very sad for him, interestingly. At one point I thought, at least he's gone, he's died, he's out of pain. But this man is walking and is parading himself as a human being, and he's not. And that for me was a tragedy, and it still is. I think when you treat another human being that way, then you have no right to the claim of humanity. And I didn't speak for at least a week. My husband said, he's never heard me so quiet. I couldn't speak. It's as if speech had abandoned me. And, and I, my husband just kept saying, are you okay? Are you okay? And I just nodded. I could not speak. Speech had deserted me for at least four days. At least four days. Anthony said, I'm worried about you. And I said, just leave me. I'll be okay. I'll come through this. I can't communicate what's happening in my head and my emotions. 
but I felt some, a deep pity for the perpetrator, a, a real pity for him, because this is a man who thinks he's a man, but actually he expressed and showed me that he was in fact a beast. How much of what happened to George Floyd do you think is connected to the history of black people and slavery? It can't be disconnected. You know, this is, this is uh, you know, at some point, uh, uh, you know, during the 17th, 18th, 19th century, somebody decided that God made them to be the, um, to, uh, to be the sole care of black people, you know, uh, the black man's, white man's burden, and I'm nobody's burden. And whenever that was decided, when did we decide that whiteness was the thing to be? Um, and if you're not, then you are less than. And, um, and, and you have to explore that. That has to be explored. When did this happen? How did this happen? Why did this happen? How do we explore? And it's going to take people of courage. And I can't think I've seen anybody who is willing to ask those profound questions about um, whiteness and blackness. When did a people, a people, group of people decide they are the best ones. God is in, in his infinite love, mercy, and wisdom, creates superior people and inferior people, and the inferior deserve to have their necks stood upon. What do you teach your children and grandchildren about race? Gosh, my, my children's got a whole litany of <laughs> sort of um, uh, lectures that I gave them as children. You will not do this, and you must be proud of yourself. And, and I remember I said to my son last week, do you remember those, those lectures I gave you? And he said, yes, Mom. <laughs> and uh, the little one, the youngest, less so, but the, the older ones, and my daughter, I remember she said to me when she was going back to university once, she said, Mommy, I haven't had any lecture this time. Because um, I lectured them about who they are. I mean, when my little girl was tiny, and she, I wanted a doll for her. And I was determined to buy a doll that looks like her. And my mom says, why can't you just buy her a doll? I said, no, it has to be a doll that looks like her. My, my, my grandchild, my grandchild, I was delighted oh, about a year ago when she said to me, Grandma, am I going to have hair like yours? And I said, yeah, um, but you're going to have a bit of your father's because he's white and grandma and mommy's black. So you'll have a mixture, but will I have Afro hair like yours? Well, probably not. And she burst into tears and she said, I just want to be like my grandma's hair. I want to be like my grandma's hair. And I went, yes! <laughs> because I gave her a sense of pride. She was only about four, but I gave her a sense of pride in her, the Afro in her hair to be proud of that. And if I did nothing else, if I've done nothing else, and every time they come, I give them little bits of history. I say, this is a queen of Africa. Is that, is that, yes. And they, so I, I don't force it on them. I buy it and I leave it around the house so they can see um, these huge um, pieces of paper with uh, black kings and queens of Africa and black people of Europe. Um, but this one incident with my daughter, my granddaughter, um, you know, I wanted her to be proud of her, her hair. Um, Grandma, am I going to, are you going to have long hair one day? No, darling, I don't want any. Um, if I were to, supposed to have it, I would have had it by now. But my hair is Afro. And am I going to be like you? Well, I hope you will be like me in many ways, not just with my hair. So for you then, what does a perfect future look like? Well, you see, I think that's a catch question, because, again, it's about black people finding the answers. Um, and, you know, and I will repeat myself. I can only hope it will be better than it is now, much, much, much better. But um, the reason why I'm reluctant to answer that is um, so often we are expected to find the solution, and I don't know what the solution is. I have a hunch, but so do others, and... Um, and together we have to find it. One party can't. One party has most work to do, but together 
if we're really serious, we will find to create a better world because it ain't good at the moment. There are some good things, but we're in, a, we're in a pickle, in a pickle, real pickle. You've said before that you aim to leave this world having made an impact. I'm just curious as to how much of an impact you think you've already made and how much you think there is still left to do personally for you? Not sure that I've made any, um, frankly. Um, I get really exasperated, you know, with me because um, I always think I can change the world. <laughs> and I sort of get really... But my poor husband, you know, or my children think, oh, there goes mom again. Um, because I'm not satisfied with the world as it is. I may not be able to change it, but by God, I'm going to have a good go. I see little point in just waking up, sleeping, eating, and drinking. That's just for me. So I'm always dreaming of ways that I can make a difference, and I will. I don't, you know, don't know if I've done anything, and I really mean that. I get really exasperated with myself because I would like a different world for my grandchildren to grow up in, and for little black boys, as Martin Luther King once said, and little black girls, not to be limited by the color of their skin, but by who they are as human beings. Thank you.